Beatriz. saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. John Piper has a sermon series on the importance of the Lord's Supper, and he makes three points in part of 
part one about what does this is my body mean? And it seemed to be very appropriate. <coughs> the first thing that it means is it's a proclamation. 1 Corinthians 11, 26. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. This is my body means, by this representation of my body, you proclaim my death for sinners until I come. You proclaim the Gospel. The bread and the cup proclaim the saving death and resurrection of Christ, because until He comes implies the resurrection. Secondly, remembrance. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. Do this in remembrance of Me. This is My body means. Let this representation of My body and blood remind you of Me. First, the death of Christ is proclaimed. And then by this proclamation, we are reminded of Christ. Remember Me, Jesus says, sitting with you in fellowship. Remember Me being portrayed and knowing all along. Remember Me giving thanks to God who ordained it all. Remember me breaking the bread just as I willingly gave my own body. Remember me shedding my blood for you so that you might live because I died. Remember me suffering to obtain for you all the blessings of the new covenant. Remember me promising that I would drink this fruit of the vine new in the kingdom. Let the memories of me and all the fullness of my love and power flood your soul at this table, which leads to the third and final meaning of the words, this is my body. Feast by faith. John 6.35 I am the bread of the life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is my body means, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, come to me and believe in me. That is, sit with me at the table and trust me to be your life-sustaining food and drink. Let the proclamation of my death and remembrance of all that I am for you awaken faith and draw you into a deeper communion with me. This is my body and this is my blood. We eat spiritually, that is by faith. That is feed your soul on all that I am for you. Nourish your heart on the blessings that I brought for you with my body and blood.
of traveling the troublesome path of a human man. We come to this table to remember the sacrifice of your son. Please bless this bread that we eat for his body that was broken. Please bless the juice for his blood that we shed for us to come to you sinless. Help us to take this communion with remembrance and reverence. In your son's most precious name we pray.
all right in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your gifts this week. You've chosen to bless us yet again. And we pass our blessings back to you. And we pray that it will help your kingdom grow in the United States and the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to set all that up by, by taking you to a court. Now imagine you're in a courtroom. Sitting in front of you is the judge. On the right side is the defense table. On the left side is the prosecution table. And uh, you are sitting at the defense table. And for your lawyer, you get a choice of two lawyers in the room. You get A, Satan, B, Jesus. Sitting on the, on the bench above you is God. 
Now understand that most of us start off at the defense table with our lawyer being Satan. We start off life and we go through it and then Satan is there to uh, convict us because of sin. He is going to convict us in our sins and the punishment for being convicted in our sins is what? Death. Spiritual death that we know the Bible calls it hell. So we have him as our attorney. But something neat happens. This other attorney goes to the cross and sacrifices himself for you so that you can then not have to have the attorney you were assigned as you live through life, but you can have a choice of the attorney you want. And if you are convicted of your sins by Christ, He will become your attorney. And as you sit there at that table and, and the court case starts, Satan is going to get up as a prosecutor and say, well, here's the following that he did. And when he gets done with you and showing your sins, you feel kind of small. And then Jesus stands up and he says, um, I want to hand over this case on my behalf to uh, the Holy Spirit. I'm going to allow him to be the uh, attorney in this case because I want to be a witness. Now imagine you're sitting there and the Holy Spirit is your attorney. He has convicted you of your sins, not in your sins. To the point that you now see hope. <coughs> and he calls as his first witness Jesus who takes the stand. And as they begin to talk, you see that there are no sins to be brought against you. The whole case has been changed. Those things you did in the past, because of your conviction of your sins, because of your acceptance as Christ as your witness, are gone. They no longer exist. The, the case comes out totally different, doesn't it? And there's a big difference in the Bible being convicted in your sins and being convicted of your sins. I want you to turn with me to the book of John. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, we're going to start with verse 5. John 16, 5. And it reads as follows. Now I am going to Him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I said, I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because, of, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no more. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Put those words into the court case and what do you get? The whole thing turned on end, don't you? What he's saying there is the one who is the prosecutor is now the what? Condemned. And that you being convicted of your sins have now been redeemed, made righteous. You see, by Him going to the Father, everything changes. By us serving a living, by us serving a living Savior. We don't serve one that died, and that's it. It's not like Buddha. 
It's not like some of these others that you see, but we serve a living Savior. One who came back to life, walked among the man, and then went back to be with the Father. Who set up this court case to be ours. He sent the counselor, the lawyer, the Holy Spirit to change us, to be in us, to be with us, to make a difference. David. You remember David? King David. What a man he was, wasn't he? Do you remember his downfall? Do you remember when he looked off his roof and he saw who? Bathsheba. And he said in his heart he had desire for her. Do you know what David cried out? Have you seen his words then after that in Psalms 51.11? David said these words, Lord, cast me not away from Thy presence, and take not Thy Holy Spirit from me. Here he was, in this place of sin, and the Holy Spirit convicted him of that sin, that he cried out to God saying, Don't leave me, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I mean, forgive me. That's his cry. And all of us need to cry those words today. I'm convinced that there's not one in this room who's perfect. I see that in Scripture. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All us. You, me, them. That side's worse than you. That's why they sit there. Well, you're getting there, right? I see the looks. That's why you moved over there. You finally made it. Uh, but you're there. But there it is. There, there's the crux of the whole thing. We cry out for forgiveness. We cry out for salvation. We cry out for Christ to be in us and of us. To convict us of our sins. Now, how many of you like being convicted of your sins? That's a joy, isn't it? When all of a sudden it slaps you in the face and you, and you realize, that's wrong? You know how long I've done that? I would like to share with you a couple sins that I've done for a long time, but, but I'm not. <laughs> But you know what I'm talking about, don't you? When all of a sudden you're saying it's like, oh. And what's neat is, is He can convict you of those sins and you can see them and, and you can ask for forgiveness of them and they're gone. What always happens? One of two things. A, you do it again. So you have to go through it again. Or B, you get rid of it. And He shows you another one. Why would he do that? Why does he want to convict you of those sins? Why does he want to keep showing you all the sins of your life? Why does he want to do that? To refine you. To, to get you a clean heart. To get you to be his. Clean and forgiven. There's a story told where uh, a golf. Well-known professional, playing in a tournament. He played with Gerald Ford, Jack Nicklaus, and Billy Graham. And they played the whole round, and he came off the golf course, and he went in the locker room, and some of the other pros were in there, and they said, how was it? He said, how was what? Playing with the president, and, and Jack Nicklaus, and Billy Graham? And he said these words. I did not come and play to have Billy Graham stuff religion down my throat. With that, he headed off to the practice team, getting ready for his next round. His friend followed and said, He pounded religion down your throat? And as the pro stood there and pounded a bucket of balls, 
he said, uh, was it really that rough out there? The man hitting the ball sighed and said in embarrassment, no, you don't get it. Billy Graham never mentioned religion. He never mentioned Jesus. Astonishing, astonishing, astonishing. <laughs> What's that word? Astonishingly, Billy Graham said nothing about God or anything. Yet the bro stopped away from the game, accusing Billy Graham of trying to ram religion down his throat. Why? <laughs> because just being around him, he was convicted of his sins. Now the question comes to this. Is it time? Have you lived a legacy that when you're around people, they feel that you're stuffing religion down their throat? when you haven't said a word? Have you lived your life to the point that they see it and don't need to hear it? I mean, obviously by this pro, it didn't bother him to be the president. It didn't bother him that Jack Nicholas was teeing off with him. But he couldn't get past <laughs> he knew of him. Maybe he didn't really know him, but he knew of him, and he knew his life, and he knew what he stood for, and he felt it. Have you ever felt it? Have you ever been in front of someone and you're convicted by, by what you see and what you what they're about? And it makes a difference in you? I gave you a commercial last week. Here's this week's commercial. In Sunday school, we're studying not a fan. And this week in the chapter, it's about living. Not just making a confession, but a commitment. About making a difference. It says if Christ is really in you, it will flip your world upside down. And everything about you will change. Has everything about you changed? Are you completely and wholly different today because of Christ? You see, in the court case at the beginning, we assumed that it was an exception. That you accepted Christ, that, that, that you allowed Him to be in your life. But what if it was only part of would he only partly testify? Read my Bible the words, God is faithful. Even when I'm not, he is. Even when I don't deserve it, he is. And not only is he faithful, <coughs> God is just. He is a God that will give you what you Deserve. He's just. I also read these words. He is a jealous God. So if He asks you for all and you only give Him part, He's jealous. He's jealous of what you're giving the rest of it to. And He's jealous that you don't give Him your all. How many of you want God jealous over you? Not a good thing, is it? When God says, I want it all, He wants it all. And when sitting in that court case, and you would hope that you could be like Billy Graham in this story. That you could sit on that witness stand and not have to say a word. Because everybody there knows. They know who you are. They know what you are. They know whose you are. 
And because of that, they themselves will become convicted. Not you. Conviction is a hard thing. If convicted in your sins, spiritual death. Period. It's done. If convicted of your sins, the ability to be forgiven of those sins, the ability to live a life for eternity with Christ in heaven. World of difference, isn't it? Today I want to know, do you, do you want to be convicted of your sins? Or convicted in them? Because as long as you have them in you, as long as you live them, as long as you commit them, you will be convicted in them. But if Christ, if Christ reigns in you, if you have a relationship with Him, then those sins have the ability to be gone. How? Repentance. You understand the word repentance? We talked about it when we said, it, is it time? Is it time to really... Repentance. To be so sorry for that you never do it again. To turn your life around and go the opposite direction. Repentance. A total change. Not partial. It's not if I'm going down the path towards sin, I veer a little left. No, because you're still kind of heading down the path. Repentance. To turn around and head the opposite direction. To go where you haven't gone before. Head towards the light. The end of the time. Turn away from hell and turn towards heaven. Repentance. To make a difference. You repent of that sin. You're so sorry for it that you ask God to forgive you of it. Now I can tell you that uh, there's a lot of things I've done in life. There's things I've said to people. There's things I've said to some of you that, that I wish I could take back sometimes. Oh man, that just came out too quick. You ever do that? How many of you ever spoke without thinking? Ah. I thought it was me. And you wish you could take it back. Front row critics. But when you look at it, and you tell the person I'm sorry, and you take it back, what? Next time you do something, what do they do? They remind you. Oh, remember the time you did this? Hmm. With God, you repent. You're so sorry for you. Ask Him to forgive you. He says, forgive it. He and what? What happens next time you do it? Does He bring up the old time? No. No. Why? He can't. It's as if it never existed as far as the east is from the west. He can't. When he forgives, he forgets. Praise God. There's some things I remember. I'm glad he doesn't. You know what I'm talking about? Man, I'm just like... And not only am I glad he doesn't remember them, I remember them and it pushes me to never do it again. I remember that. And I don't want to do it again. But there are those ones that we do over and over and over. How many times do we have to ask for forgiveness? Every time. And how many times will He forgive you? Ask until you what? Until you're embarrassed? Ever been embarrassed? Or ashamed to go to God and ask Him again? You know, to have to say, here I am again. For the 
and 89th time, here I am again. And I say that because the Bible says 70 times 7, and that's 490. So we're just at the verge. He's faithful to forgive, isn't he? But he wants us to be serious about the forgiveness that we ask for. You know, I, I see these people that get arrested time and time again, and, and, and they go before the judge, and the judge says this, if I see you in here one more time, I will pull the book at you. You will get the max I can give you. In other words, I'm tired of dealing with you. Okay? And you better hope you never get before that judge again. You better hope he doesn't remember your name. <coughs> Our judge isn't like that, is it? Come to me all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, ask for free give us now. I'll grant it. But you have to be sincere of heart. You have to be repentant of heart. You have to be ready for it. Ask for it. And receive it. What kind of sins? What kind of sins do we ask for forgiveness for? All. The big ones? No. All. The small ones? All. What about the little white lies? All. Aren't we funny as humans? That's categorizing. What I said to you guys about being your fourth anniversary when it was fifth year, just teasing. But maybe some people did. Maybe some people didn't take that way. So sorry. But look, we like to categorize. Well, that was just a joke. That was a that was a white lie. Well, that was just teasing. That was just we call it whatever we want. But sin is sin is sin, right? <coughs> Is there a sin bigger than another? No. Smaller than another? No. Sin is sin is sin. And when we ask for forgiveness of sins, we have to be sorry for that sin and we have to be able to get beyond that sin. God gets beyond it. It's us that have the issues. And when someone asks you for forgiveness and you say the words, I forgive you, what's our next step? To forgive. To forgive. If you say, I forgive you, you never have the right again to bring it up. It's gone. How many of you bring it up? It's a sin. You forgive them for their sins, and then you went and sinned with that same sin. Okay? we got to be the mind of Christ. We've got to be more like Him. We've got to understand what He's talking about when He says, be like Me. Follow Me. Obey Me. There's a reason He says it, because on our own, we're going to fail. But Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives Me the strength. Okay? And he wants to help you. He wants to strengthen you. That's the reason He left the Holy Spirit to convict you. He left the Holy Spirit to help you through this part of life while He's not here. It's our strength. It's our ability to see, man, that, that's wrong. I've got to do it right. And, and we need to be convicted of those sins so we can get rid of them. And in getting rid of them, then we have to live different and not the same. I don't want to be convicted in my sins. Because I know my sins are enough to send me to hell. And I know that sometimes my sins don't just affect me, they affect my family and they affect my friends. And my sins can affect the church. And my sins cannot just send me to hell, sometimes my sins might send you to hell if you're following me. And so I say to you all the time, don't follow me. Follow Christ. Christ is the one that, that we follow. He's the perfect example. Not me. I'm here as your preacher, human, sinner, trying to do my best to help you do your best. But sometimes my best will not be good enough. And so don't place faith here. Don't place trust here. Don't, 
That belongs to God and to Jesus. We're all in this together. And so as we go towards our trial, we're all going to have one. We're all going to stand before God someday and, and we're going to be judged. And my prayer is this. That the day I stand there, there's nothing to be judged for. That in the end, I, I got it close to right that, that I asked God to forgive me and I, I was cleansed and I'm clean. And when I stand there, it's all been forgotten. And Jesus as my witness stands alongside me to, to, to be bear witness for anything that might be there. To say, Dad, I, I know how tough that was. I remember when I was in a wilderness and I was tempted that this is what happened. And I know how tough it is down the road. That's what I want. I want the judge to say in the verdict, not guilty. Enter in a good and faithful servant. But I know that it takes effort and work every day. It takes me being forgiven of my sins and being big enough to forgive you of yours. And I know that if I can't forgive you of yours, why would God ever want to forgive me of mine? And we got to get it straight. We've got to get it together. we got to know. It's sins of commission, sins of omission, sins that are little, that we think are little, but sins are big. Sin is sin, and we've got to get them all out. And so the Holy Spirit left here for us to convict us of that, to strengthen us, to help us through, is slowly going to convict us of those sins that we don't know about in our life that all of a sudden it reveals to us, oh, I've done that 20 years. And that's wrong. And then I have to get forgiveness of it. And as he points out more, I've got to change. So that I can be changed to be more like him. So that I can walk like him and talk like him. So that people, when they see me, I don't have to say a word. They know. This golfer knew. Just by the way that maybe Billy Graham played the game. I mean, I played with some. How many of you in here play golf? I know we did this before, and there's like three of you. Three of you. Yes, three of you. Ah, uh, we were right. In golf, when you hit the ball, it's called a stroke. And when you tee off from the tee box to the green, however many strokes, however many times you hit that ball until it falls in the hole, that's what you count. So if I tee off here, and it takes me five hits to get to the hole, on that hole I get a five. And the object is to take as little bomb strokes as you can in 18 holes. Now, I have played with people. I have played with people who hit one out of bounds and re tee and hit it in the middle of the fairway and then hit one in the water and set it back up and hit it across and get it on the green and three putt and call it a five. <laughs> I played in a tournament where that was turned in. And, and the other three of us stood there going, I mean, he had to see the looks on our face. It was like, do you want to count those again? Well, one to the middle of the fairway, one at the edge, hit it across, a couple putts, five. What about the ones out of bounds? Why well, re-hit? Yes, one out of bounds, re t is two, hit is three, the other hit into the water is four, reset your ball, five, Hit under the green is six, three putts, nine. And he said, oh, well, I don't regularly count those. <laughs> Gang, if a hit in golf was the equivalent of a sin, understand this. God counts them all. Not just the ones you meant to do or not just the ones you didn't mean to do. He counts them all. Sin is sin. They all count. They all have to be forgiven. They all have to be worked out. They have to be cleansed in order and to live in you. You understand what the Bible says about sin? God can have nothing to do with it. Nothing. When Jesus was on the cross and He took the sins of the world on His shoulders, what was God's response? Turn away from him. Separation. 
Jesus cried out those words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forgotten me? Why have you turned your back on me? Because he had sin on him. And if God can turn his back on his own son because of sin, you had better be careful. So he sent the Holy Spirit to guide us, lead us, and convict us so that we can get the sin out. I heard one preacher say that the Holy Spirit is our shout. Ever you shout and do laundry? Spray it on and get that tough stain out? The Holy Spirit is our shout that we use to get those tough sins out. To convict us to get them so they're gone so that we can be His. Okay, my prayer is that you get it. That you realize it's time that we get it straight with Him. That we start living the life He wants us to live. That you understand what the legacy is that you live so that when people play golf with you, they're convicted even if you say nothing. So that people understand who's you are. And they can't understand that unless you know it. So this morning, whose are you? Who runs your life? Who do you live for? What's your driving force in this world? Every one of those answers should be Jesus. If it's not, you have work to do with your relationship with Him and in your own life. To get the sins out that you can see that that He has to be all in all everything. So this morning, if you're sitting here, you've never given your life to Christ, I want you to think about it. I want you to think what the results of that is. Scripture's plain. A life without Christ in the end is hell. And I don't think anyone who believes in Jesus in this room wants that for you today. They want you to understand who Jesus is and they want you to accept Him as your Lord and Savior. And we're going to sing a hymn of invitation in a minute that allows you the opportunity to do that. Step up and say, hey, I want that. I want Jesus, not just Jesus. I want the Holy Spirit. I want God. I want all that in me to cleanse me, to make me right, that I too can live forever and eternity with them. Or maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ. you got to do that. Or you're sitting here and you gave your life to Christ. And, and what? You think I'm okay. I'm covered. The one hour on Sunday morning, got it. But what about the rest of the week? The one hour on Sunday morning doesn't get it. You see, because as I read my Bible, I understand this. Even Satan believes. It's just not enough to be here Sunday morning and to believe, gang. It's about living the life. It's about the relationship with Him. It's about giving your all. Morning, noon, and night. Every day, first of your life. Maybe you're sitting here and you're giving your life to Christ and you kind of sat back on your roll and you're kind of like, okay, I'm good. Yeah. you got to be doing it. you got to do it to the point that people see the difference in you without you ever saying a word. And if they don't see it, then you better start speaking it. So that they understand. And we've got to change. We've got to be His and His alone. So if you have a decision to make this morning, maybe for the first time, to be His, may the Holy Spirit convict you of that to step out. Well, if you're sitting here this morning and you've made your decision for Christ at some point in your life, and, and you know who you are, you know what decision you made, and you know what you've done with it. If you need to do more than this morning, be convicted of that and let Him speak to you and you speak to Him and tell Him that you need to do better. Allow Him to change you and use you this way. So we're going to stand and sing. We're not going to stand and sing. How are we doing invitation?
Jeff? Is it Jeff? It is Jeff. Uh, we're going to let Jeff invite us to the uh, row. I forgot they told me that. Either. And then we'll uh, So if you have a decision to make while Jeff sings, uh, pay close attention to the words, pay close attention to the pictures, very meaningful, and you'll see what we're looking for.
the people of history and generations, and, and then the question, who will be the one? Will you be the one? The invitation time. Who will be the one? Who will stand with us to be the difference in this world? Jeff stands there singing. And at the end, what's the last word you say? I will be the one. And I'll tell you, I'll be the one. Who else? Will you be the one? Will you stand with us when all else fall? That's the question. Is it time for you to stand? Have you been convicted of your sins enough to stand? Are you ready to live the legacy that comes with standing? The question for all of us. And this week I pray you can say, I'll be the one. And I'll stand when all else falls. And I'll be there, the one. And stand for what? I'll stand for those who can't stand for themselves. I'll stand for those in abortion. I'll stand for those in drugs. I'll stand for those in sin. I'll stand for those who are being sold on the market today. I'll stand. I'll make a difference. I'll be the one. I'll stand for Jesus when no one else will stand. Lord, we pray. Father, we thank You. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for our ability to gather here this morning. Father, we thank You for Jeff and the words of his song that asks that question. And Father, I just pray that we're convicted enough that we can say yes. I'll stand. Yes, I'll be the one. Father, that's what it's all about is us standing and making a difference in this world for You and in all realms. That people understand and get it that you are still on your throne. That you're the ultimate ruler. That, Father, it's you that allows the world to stand. And Father, we will stand with you and we wait for the day that you will send your Son to return to, to gather those of us who stood home to you. Father, our prayer is this, that this week we'll stand, that we'll make a difference, that we'll be your hands and feet in this world, that we will be living your way with your will to show up. Father, we love you and we thank you for the time here. We pray that you'll go with us now and strengthen us as we depart to the world. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen.